Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Before we get into today's broadcast, let me quickly just share with you some things that are going on. Uh, Israeli News Live is preparing uh, to travel to the United States late this summer, uh, actually uh, late July, early August. And as well, we are intending on putting together a conference in early August. Uh, a couple of different things we'll be covering in this conference, but we will be uh, hosting a debate on the flat earth. Uh, that is something that we have never actually taken a position on ourselves, but because we get so much information from uh, viewers that are pro-flat earth and those that are against the flat earth, we decided to host a friendly debate with two men that actually know one another uh, to make it a little bit more cordial so it's not so much of an attack on one another. But the two men that will be in this debate will be none other than Dr. Stephen Pidgeon and author Zen Garcia. Both these men will come together uh, in a friendly debate that will be held in Atlanta, Georgia. We'll be giving you more details about this upcoming event. Of course, also the weekend of the event, uh, that'll actually be on, on a Saturday evening, the debate, and then also the, the, the conference will go over into Sunday. I'll be speaking myself uh, looking at an, an entire overview of the Middle East and, the, and how it is being affected in prophecy. My wife, Yana, will be speaking Saturday as well, uh, and possibly one or two other speakers that will be speaking in regards to uh, vaccines and the dangers of vaccines. So a lot of different subjects will be covered during this uh, weekend that we'll be doing there in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, on a weekend uh, uh, beginning of August there, which we will update you. And certainly do ask your, your help in supporting uh, this trip that we'll be making there. We definitely will need your help. And, uh, and we may make ourselves available as well to speak in other places as well while we are there. So if you're interested in any of this, you can contact us by e emailing us at stephenbenoon at gmail.com. I'll put that link in there and uh, we will try to keep you updated as we put these things together. Uh, anyway, going uh, right into the broadcast today that we're working on here, very different type of a news broadcast. Generally, I'm, I, I, whether we're dealing with news that is breaking, which it is news breaking that we're speaking about today, but we're also dealing with prophetic insights. Well, in this case here, this is a prophecy that we're going to be speaking about today that we feel like is trying to be manipulated by none other than Rome itself. So we've entitled the article today, Is Rome Trying to Manipulate Prophecy? Of course, in their own favor. That does seem very obvious to us. Now we're going to examine a little bit about the war uh, going on in Syria, what's surrounding there. As we look at the article here that's coming out of uh, uh, the Middle East from the Middle East Eye. Uh, .net, Jordan and U.S. begin war games amid claims of Syria buildup. Uh, the, the, the war game is called Eager Lion. It begins weeks after U.S. intervention in neighboring Syria and Iranian claims of a planned incursion through Jordan. Uh, the article goes on to say Jordan and the United States kicked off annual exercises known as Eager Lion on Sunday with about 7,400 troops. Uh, from more than 20 nations taking part, officials said. U.S. and Jordanian officials said the maneuvers would uh, include border security, cyber defense, and command and control. Exercises and bolster coordination in response to threats, including terrorism. Joint efforts and coordination and exchange of expertise are needed in the time when the region is facing the threat of terrorism, said Khalid al Shara, a Jordanian brig brigadier general. Now, this is one thing that we see here that's going on, and as we've already been reporting to you, there has been uh, a lot of tensions there at the border of Al Tanf uh, in Syria, uh, right there next to the border of, uh, of course, where Jordan and Iraq both come together there on uh, the edge of Syria there. We have seen U.S. forces on that side. We've seen British, Norwegian special forces that have crossed into Syria. And also the Iraqis have been moving up their own militias to confront uh, the U.S. as well as the uh, Syrian military and the Free Syrian Army also. All these different groups coming, facing off head to head there, which could turn into a major mess. And it seems like that this may be something that is actually intended to be happening. 
It may be that, uh, as General Wesley Clark brought out to the American people some time ago, that the United States had plans to take down seven different nations in the Middle East. And of course, Iran was one of those nations. Well, the one way to be able to draw Iran out into a battle is to have a confrontation inside of Syria as President Trump sets up what he uh, identifies as safe zones inside of Syria. And if that goes challenged by the Syrian go uh, government or even by the Iranians, uh, then there definitely will end up being a confrontation that will spill much further that will also justify the means for the United States to take down Damascus and even for reaching further out and trying to take out Iran all at the same time. That, as we've stated before, will not go over very well because we find out, biblically speaking, Jordan becomes a, a desolation as a result of this type of war. And also we find that it may actually affect Israel pretty heavily. But it's not only that there. As we see, another article here, this come out on uh, Iraqi news, the Baghdad Times, I believe it is, or BaghdadPost.com. U.S. threatens to strike Iran to protect forces in Iraq and Syria. That's a very interesting new threat that just came out today. U.S. threatened to strike Iran and Tehran if tried to uh, uh, obstacle of U.S. Force, forces in Iraq and Syria. Kuwaiti newspaper Al Rai quoted U.S. sources on Monday. U.S. conveyed a message to Iran through Russian officers who had participated in the U.S.-Russian summit, the sources added. The summit aimed at enhancing coordination over military operations in Syria to avoid any clashes between U.S. and Russia. In the meantime, Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman Baharam Qasami said that Tehran didn't receive any message from the U.S. On Saturday, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani spoke to Russian President Vladimir Putin about the Syrian crisis. Earlier, a U.S. strike had targeted Iranian militaries, excuse me, militias uh, in al tanf in Syria. The strike asserted that Iran ignored the U.S. message. In a statement, Iran criticized U.S.-Saudi alliance, claiming their joint stances toward the current crisis in the region will lead to more instability. So, it's definitely gearing up, and the question is, is where is it going to end up at? Now, also, moving on over to uh, already happened on their website there, they're showing the, uh, the missile test that was done yesterday inside of North Korea. North Korea continuing uh, to vow to do more and more as the U.S. enters into uh, its own, uh, uh, again, another military exercise with Seoul, South Korea in the region. This time, according to news sources that are coming out about the uh, exercises happening in the Far East there, is that the U.S. Uh, will be using the B-1 bombers as well. And so uh, that's another big concern that is going on. That's being reported by RT. Seoul confirms joint drill with U.S. B-1 bombers as North Korea promises bigger gift package for the Yankees. What in the world are they talking about there? I would assume that that's going to be that six nuclear test that uh, Kim Jong-un has promised that they would do. The South Korean military confirmed on Tuesday that it took part in a joint war games with the U.S. featured a supersonic B-1 bomber. Pyongyang slammed the drill, threatening the Yankees with retaliation while boasting the test of, new of a new missile. The military exercise dubbed a nuclear bomb dropping roll drill by North Korea state media were held on Monday, South Korean Defense Ministry spokesman Moon Sang-gyeon said as cited by Reuters. Now don't forget, Russia has also stated that, uh, that the U.S. needs to show restraint because any type of nuclear war would cause a fallout, a radioactive fallout in Russia's eastern province, something that Russia is not willing to accept. So therefore, Russia and China both have anti-defense uh, missile systems there present and ready to go. And speaking of that, let me just quickly jump back over here to Twitter. I know I didn't have this up just now, but there is another movement of troops that I just so happen to remember from uh, our good friend Lorenzo there on Already Happened. Uh, he had just sh shared on his Twitter page uh, Actually, yesterday, I believe it was here. Here we go right here. Well, no, that's another one. Dutch Army trucks with Leopard 2 tanks on the move towards uh, Arnhem Highway 850. Uh, that's something I did not see before there. But here it is right here. Uh, this is, uh, no, that's the test. There, here we go. We got it right here. China has recently relocated its military forces inside uh, Eastern Theater Command, including the PGZ-95S Air Defense. 
Uh, there is, of course, this long uh, row of military equipment being moved inside of China. That's something you don't see very often at all, making it uh, to the media there. Here is their, uh, their air defense system, the PG-795S air defense system. Friends, I mean, this is just not looking good. And, I, and I, I know good and well that China is not worried about North Korea striking them uh, at all. So uh, it's a very serious situation that's going on over there inside of China uh, and South Korea, North Korea, etc. there. And of course, the Japanese, South Koreans, and the U.S. all concerned about the nuclear weapons that Kim Jong-un uh, has and what he may very well could or could do with those weapons. Uh, and whether or not will China come to his aid in Russia or will they uh, stand down while the U.S. tries to remove this man from power if President Trump decides to make that move? Now that still remains a big question. But then I ran across something else. And that is a prophecy that keeps coming to my mind. And actually the main prophecy here, and I'm going to drop down to it real quick to the main part of the prophecy. Uh, and that is in verse 26 and 27, then we'll back up just a moment. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my Father. Now generally, most believers in Yeshua, believers in Jesus, believe this to be a prophecy of speaking about Jesus that he will rule the nations with a rod of iron, that he's the one that is the overcomer. But could this be something that Rome is playing out and trying to make that prophecy go into a certain direction? Could it be that the one that overcomes of this Thyatira church, could it be that that one that overcomes is supposedly the Antichrist or the false messiah? that will be introduced to the world. And that that Messiah, he will, have, he will be given power over the nations of the earth and shall rule them with a rod of iron. In other words, missiles. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Broken to shivers? Potters? Remember the scriptures in the Bible speaking, especially that I believe over in the book of Romans and everything says, take me down to the potter's house, break me back into shivers, remold me over again. There's so many prophecies throughout the Bible, even that of Jeremiah speaking about the potter and the clay. And we are the clay pots, in other words, that are to be remolded over. Well, in this case here, could it be that Rome has their own idea of the interpretation of this scripture and that they're so-called Messiah, which we would call an Antichrist that will come on the scenes here in this latter days, will be given power over the nations to rule them with an rod of iron. In other words, they dictate which countries you're allowed to take down. Is that plausible to begin with? Let's back up just a moment here. Let's look at Thyatira. And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira, write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience in thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Interesting, isn't it? And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Now, I personally believe that the Jezebel is none other than Rome. But I'm sure Rome has a different interpretation to these scriptures. And I gave her space to repent of her fornications, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now, could this be that Rome has its own plans about how to bring the Middle East peace about with their own Messiah, their own Antichrist, and of course, bringing down those nations to their knees, bringing these pots, breaking them into splinters there and remold them to their own ideology. Behold, I will cast her into bed with them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Now it's obvious 
that when Jesus is speaking here, that this really has nothing to do with what could be fabricated in the minds of those in Rome. But he says, But unto you I say, and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and the vessels of the potter shall, he, shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. Now, we can flip it around and see the truth of what the prophecy lays there, but we could also see how that Rome may be planning on perverting this prophecy. Let me give you some interesting points here just to get you to understand where I'm speaking about on this. Uh, I remember Joel Bainerman, and of course Barry Chalmers and him were very good friends. Joel Bainerman was an Israeli journalist that wrote, How Does the Vatican View the Legitimacy of Israel's Claim to Jerusalem? And I know that now we're looking at Israel, and we might, you might say, well, how does this got to do with Syria and the wars that are going on there? Everything. You have to remember the prophecy of Daniel 11 where they come in and they divide the land for gain. 11 verse 39, chapter 11 verse 39 in Daniel. As I said, it's Adama. The, uh, uh, it's the, the earth. They divide the earth for gain. But Jerusalem is that main prize that they're looking for. All right? And so everything that is going on in the Middle East is to crush those that are not willing to come under the control of the Vatican and to bow down and to obey what they say to do. Then therefore they must be broken into shivers. Notice how Thyatira writes. This is why I say, now keep in mind, this is an anti-type of what the prophecy really intends to speak. Okay? That's why it says you've left your first love. So in Rome's theology, you left the Catholic Church. This is why you saw when uh, uh, the different dignitaries from around the world, when they come, they make the women dress in black dresses with a black veil on. Why? Because they are in repentance and mourning for leaving the Catholic Church. And recently, Pope Francis has talked about lifting that restriction. Why? Because the churches are coming back home to Mother Rome. That's why. Didn't know that, did you? Let's look at what uh, some of the key points that Joel Bainerman brings out in this article that he writes. This is on Red Moon Rising, by the way, if you want to look up the article. Most Israelis have probably never thought very much about what the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, thinks about the end of days theology. Jews themselves don't give much thought to what will happen when Gog and Magog takes place. Jews don't go in for anything less bit uh, least bit next world, but instead are firmly planted in the here and now. And that's good, he says. However, it doesn't matter what Jews think. What matters is what the Vatican believes, Joel writes, and why it believes this. Judaism and the modern Jewish thought pretty much just dismisses the basic tenets of Catholicism outright and doesn't even bother addressing the core questions of what is behind Catholic theological claims. Let's go to the next part of the article here. I'm going to kind of read some of the, uh, the, the squared off points that I put in here and read here. All right, so now what matters is what they believe and what they plan to do about making their beliefs come, become a reality. Let me just, let me back, I need to pick up part of this paragraph with this anyway. All right, so they, uh, Joel talks about that, you know, they consider that the things that the Vatican does pretty much to be pagan, eating of holy wafers, sprinkling of baptism water of people's heads, that may, that may be true, and, but it doesn't matter. What matters is what they believe, he states here. Uh, people's heads, that they, okay, what they believe is what matters, and they plan to do about making their beliefs become a reality. He says, states here, the institution of the Vatican is not understood by Israelis and Jews. The conventional wisdom you get from the spokesperson in Israeli government ministries and the conventional Israeli media is both sides have great intentions to do good. And that's about it. When it comes to Israel's bilateral affairs, nothing much gets investigated by the Israeli media. Thus, a secret deal could be done between the Vatican and the state of Israel, and nobody in Israel would ever find out about it. And he notes here, in fact, that is exactly what happened. And he's referring to the, during the time that the Oslo Accords were going on. Now, it's not the Oslo Accords themselves that was dangerous. It was the secret c 
covenant that was being made between the Israeli authorities and the Vatican at that time. He says here, this, is, this uh, essay will provide a background as well as what the Vatican's intentions in, uh, regarding Israel as the old city of Jerusalem. It will reveal which Israeli politicians made certain comments to the Vatican regarding the issues of sovereignty in the old city of Jerusalem. These negotiations and meetings were carried out in secret. During the period of 1992 to 1995, the Oslo Accords was what got all the public's attention. Also, uh, Oslo was like throwing sand in the eyes of the public. The Vatican is where the real action was happening. Oslo seemed to be just the cover story, a red herring, if you will. So what does the Vatican want, he writes? It can't be that the Vatican is only interested in the access to the holy sites in Jerusalem. Because he goes on to write, they've already had, they already got that. They've had it since 1948. Uh, he says, no, the Pope's demand demanded the interna internationalizing of Jerusalem. It is something else which the Vatican wants. The Roman Catholic Church need to have certain versions of events be played out for them to stand in front of mankind and proclaim our Messiah has returned. All right. Now he claims that this Messiah will be a false and as he says supposedly was the first which I do not agree with that but that's what he states. All right. He says, they know this isn't the end of the story that the Jewish God had in mind, but that doesn't mean they won't try and engineer their own ending to the story. So what if it is fraudulent doesn't matter. That is their game plan, and that is what matters, and that is what Israeli Jews need to be, to better, to be better informed about. It is important for everyone to know what the Vatican... Uh, what they have up their sleeves because it directly, is directly relates to our existence and future destiny as an independent nation. This is a very powerful force, this scheming to get control of the old city of Jerusalem, he notes. And dropping down to the next box here, uh, he says here, the Vatican has attempted to obtain control of Jerusalem, which started in the Crusades. For them to convince the world that the Messiah they put on the world stage is going to be accepted as genuine, they need to perform this play out in the old city, he notes. The story of this production is that the Messiah will merge the three monotheistic religions, usher in peace and harmony in the world, and solve the Middle East conflict. Now here's what's interesting, friends. There's nothing about the Messiah scripturally that merges the three monotheistic religions. Joel Bainerman writes that this is what they, that they intend on doing with the Messiah that they believe is coming. Uh, also to resolve the Middle East conflict. Well, it definitely all in, there ain't no doubt about that. So, uh, but it doesn't just come, it's not just that simple. He also writes, this so-called Messiah that will be proclaimed will be a false one and it will insist that by having a it will and it will insist that by having a world government, i.e. the United Nations, the world peace and harmony will be ushered in. This will be a lie and a fraud, but never mind, in a world reality isn't important. Public perceptions are the end result is the stripping of Israel's sovereignty, Joel writes. He also writes in here, Mount Zion is critical for the program. They have planned to put into play in our capital city. The deal that is signed with Israel via Yossi Balin and Shimon Perez in secret without approval of the Knesset gives the church not only extra, uh, extra territorial status to their properties, which is what the bilateral agreement uh, the Israeli government signed with the Vatican on December 30th, 1993, put into law, but of control over the entire city as custodians under UN presence. In this way, the Jews will give up control over the old city, the Vatican, to the Vatican, and the Israeli people would have a problem, excuse me, and the, and the Vatican, the Israeli people would have a problem with. To the UN, they would say, we had no choice. Strange, isn't it? Now, that's what it states right there. Let me take you, though, and share with you just some points that he makes out as far as in the timing of everything. October 1991, on the 12th, the head of the World Jewish Congress, Edgar Bronfman, uh, Bronfman is appointed head of the International Jewish Committee 
of interreligious consulta cons consultation to conduct officials' contacts with the Vatican and the State of Israel. Isn't that interesting? Still, not, not, not this meeting long. I say we have the new president now. Now we have the, Mr. Lauder of S.A. Lauder Corporation, who is now the president of the Jewish Congress, that's still working for this peace initiative with the Vatican and Israel. And, of course, for the sovereignty that the Vatican will have over uh, that of the old city of Jerusalem. And by the way, if you notice there, as we brought this out the other day on Israeli News Live, about the redrawing of the maps of Israel and the Golan being gone, but in the article, the Israelis were speaking about how that the old city was no longer, according to the White House's own map, the old city was no longer under Israeli control. Of course not. They've already voted it all away. March 1992, on the 17th, Jerusalem Mayor Teddy Kolek says Israeli government should meet the Vatican's demand to apply special status for Jerusalem. April 1992, uh, on April the 1st, the Vatican announced that it, that it favors a labor victory in the June 1992 general elections in Israel. Why? It didn't like the other party at all. Uh, April 15th, Cardinal jo uh, Joseph Ratzinger, one of the highest ranking diplomats at the Vatican, visits Israel for the first time but only meets with Jerusalem Mayor Teddy Kolek. Well, of course, he's in favor of giving away Jerusalem already. The story of the Catholic Church's June 1992 attempt to excuse me, abscond with the old city of Jerusalem from the Jews begins in July 1992. According to the information of the Foreign Ministry website, literally from the moment the new Rabin-led labor government took over from Yitzhak Shamir's defeated Likud party, secret talks with the Vatican and the State of Israel began. What precipitated these secret talks? Who arranged these talks and why? That's interesting, isn't it? November 1992. The document which was used as the underlying ideological basis of the Vatican's secret deal with Yossi Balin and Shimon Perez was personally authored by Balin. The, uh, the illegitimacy of Israel's sovereignty of Jerusalem outlined, that's the name of the article by the way, the illegitimacy of Israel's sovereignty over Jerusalem. Can you imagine a Jewish person actually writing something like this? Outlines the Israeli government's program for a future Jerusalem and calls for the division of the old city into cantons whose border post will be under UN control. The plan which led to the December 1993 agreement between the Vatican and the State of Israel was originally discussed in November 1992. At the exact same time, the first meetings in London took place to discuss an agreement between Israel and the PLO which led to the Oslo agreements. The real goal was the Vatican's attempt to take over the city of Jerusalem. Oslo, or peace between Israel and the Palestinians, was just a good cover story to hide what was really going on in another sphere in Israel's foreign affairs. Notice this, September 1993 on the 10th. This is when uh, the Oslo Accords, Washington, the, the Italian newspaper La Stampa reported that Foreign Minister Shimon Perez concluded a secret deal with the Vatican to hand over the sovereignty of Jerusalem's old city to the Vatican. The agreement and it was included in the secret clauses of the declaration of the principles signed on September 13, 1993 in Washington, D.C. In the same week, the Foreign Minister and Chief Oslo Architect Shimon Perez signed a declaration of principles with Yasser Arafat in Washington. The Israeli Vatican commissioned and held a special meeting in Israel. Under the Vatican agreement, the Israelis would give over control of the old city to the Vatican before the year 2000. The plan also calls for Jerusalem to become the second Vatican of the world with all three major religions presented but under the authority of the Vatican. Jerusalem will remain the capital of Israel, but the old city will be administered by the Vatican. Imagine that. So when Russia stands up and declares that they believe that uh, Israel, uh, that, that, that West Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and that they're their only nation to ever do so, that's no big thing. That's not even true. That is a false statement because that is what was done with the secret deal between the Vatican and Israel to start with and that they would get the West Jerusalem, the Palestinians would get East Jerusalem, but the Vatican gets the old city. Well, what do you know about that? And they also it means that gives the Vatican control of the Temple Mount. And it wasn't only the Vatican. The Jordanians were involved in this as well. All right, watch what it says. Arafat agreed to the plan just before the famous handshake in 1993. But when he realized that the Vatican was also going to let Israel share in a temple mount, he rejected it. All right, 
To get Arafat and the Palestinians on board, on February 14, 2000, the PA did sign an agreement with the Vatican which recognized the Palestinians' claims to East Jerusalem. See, that's when they got East Jerusalem. It was after he rejected the Third Temple idea. The outbreak of the al aqsa Mosque in Intifada seven months after this agreement was signed uh, may have been part of the commitment Arafat gave the Vatican as to what he would do for him in return to the Vatican acknowledging Palestinians' claims to East Jerusalem and the right to statehood. The violence in the Middle East serves the Catholic Church's interests, especially if Jerusalem is the subject to discuss. It's got to do with a lot of areas in, in that part of the world. Oh my gosh, friends. All right, November 1993. In a report, Jerusalem Weekly newspaper, Kol Ha'ir, it was revealed that for the past six months, the Israeli government has been taking advice on the future Jerusalem from planning commission headed by a close aide of Teddy Kolek, Ranam Weitz, formerly the settlement director of the Jewish agency at a secret meeting on September 19, 1993, one day before Prime Minister uh, Rabin signed the recognition agreement with the PLO and the Israel. The forum met secretly and approved the, in principle a plan for Jerusalem concocted by whites, which he calls Metropolitan Jerusalem. Jeez. You know, I could go on and on with this, and I won't go into everything, but there is one that I want to see if I can find real quick for you. But it's nothing but the Vatican having sovereignty over Jerusalem's old city and of course you know it, it may seem and I, I was trying to find the one where they meet oh here's another one that's very important too July 1994 uh, on the 9th the Vatican's foreign minister Jean-Louis Toron announces in Amman Jordan before territorial problems are resolved we have to find international guarantees to safeguard the uniqueness of the city and assurances that never again one party should claim Jerusalem as the possessions again that was because the Vatican's going to control it right it's exactly what was... Oh, here, here's the one I wanted to share with you. November 1994, Israel signs a peace treaty with Jordan, which according to the reports of the Haaretz Marif and Yediot uh, Achronot, including secret clauses concerning water and Jerusalem, the agreement had been negotiated in London eight months before between Rabin, King Hussein, and Lord Victor Mishkan. As part of the agreement, Jordan would receive control over the Islamic holy sites within a Vatican-controlled old city of Jerusalem. Why do you think the Vatican has worked so much with King Abdullah II? But you know what's interesting? Maybe the Vatican wants to get complete control even over those sites as well. Maybe this is why the Vatican is authorizing Jordan to be the launching pad of a war with Syria and even that of Iran. You know, if Rome were to take out Jordan, then Rome has full control of the old city. No more Jordan, only the Vatican. Replacement theology will prevail. And as the one friend that sent me the email about drawing the Israeli forces out into the open in a war with Syria, that would weaken the, the Israeli forces to give uh, the world leaders more of a leverage to force this two-state solution on Israel. Not so much the two-state solution, but forcing the hand of internationalizing Jerusalem. Yeah, West Jerusalem remains under Israeli capital, but the old city, you'll have, what, priests guarding the gates? No, they won't do it like that but they will have full control over it then. And that's what's coming, friends. But the serious part is, is when we see all of this, when we see that what Joel Bainerman wrote about, and then we look at what we see here in the prophecy here, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And I know this is applying to Jesus, so don't, don't misunderstand me what I'm saying here. But could it be that Rome would like to manufacture this prophecy for their own purpose. He'll give them power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Well, it looks like to me, NATO forces are pounding into splinters the peoples of the Middle East. I think this is why Jordan ends up becoming desolate. I don't think Rome is willing to share with Jordan control over the old city. That sums it up for me right now. I know it's a little bit lengthy. I apologize for that. I'm Stephen Benoon. You've been watching Israeli News Live. 
Definitely support the broadcast here if you're catching it either on Israeli News Live or Danun Institute. Uh, join us here. Go to IsraeliNewsLive.org. We have a place you can donate there. We do need your support, especially for this upcoming trip in the United States. Uh, it's a big endeavor. We'll need to fly in both speakers, uh, so the cost will be, be pretty much up there to do this. But we think it'll be a blessing for the people to have a friendly debate over this flat earth issue as well. The following day, I'll be doing a Middle East prophecy uh, uh, meeting there in Atlanta, Georgia. We'll be putting this together very rapidly. Uh, you, you basically have about two months to prepare if you're able to come, and we're trying to do this before school starts in the United States, at least in parts of the South, that is. We know that school starts on the 8th, uh, so it will be like the weekend before uh, school will be starting. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom.